Hello, Houston. We are going to finish language production today so that we're ready for the uh, second exam, which normally comes after this particular um, tape. Just as a quick review for you, we're going to go directly to the screen and show you, first of all, that we're now on tape 18 when we get to it. Oh, I see why they don't want to go to the screen yet. Let me put the full screen on so that I've done my job, and now we'll show it to you. Um, so we're on tape 18. Uh, 17, no, we're on 17 finishing. That's what we're doing. I'll get straightened out here eventually. And in fact, this is just a brief review of what we were kind of rushing through at the end of the hour last time. We were talking about the work of two different anthropologists, uh, Erlin and Kay, who had basically done a very interesting study of some hundred different languages around the world and approached uh, a number of them, 20 kind of representing a distribution of the way in which color names are applied. And they asked native speakers of those languages to identify colors uh, using their own language in whatever way they, they wish to, and then also to identify through that strategy what they were able to identify, what they called the focal or most typical color names that were used in that situation. And from that, when you look at the, at the results of those experiments, there were kind of three major conclusions that they reach. The first one was that focal colors are very similar for all groups, regardless of how the language describes the color. Those that were identified as focal or important or, or central in some way were very consistent across all the groups. And what they showed was that the, the languages that were surveyed took their colors from 11 different color names, as indicated over on the right side of the screen there, and I won't review them with you again. But when only some color names are used, there is a very clear hierarchy of selection. And as I showed you, if there are only two, it tends to be black and white or light and dark in terms of the various colors. Secondly, if, the, if another color is introduced, it tends to be red, so that you end up, if you have three color names in your language, with red, white, and black, and so forth. The next three are drawn almost exclusively from the yellow, green, um, blue category, uh, and so forth. Um, so that basically what we've got, sorry, the um, yellow, yeah, yellow, green, and blue. I mis misread there for a second. But in essence, what that implies then is that there is a very stable hierarchy, a kind of a rank-ordered increased likelihood of selection, depending on how many color names the language itself actually has. So that the, the second conclusion then was that there are some very basic constraints on how we actually uh, perceive uh, color. That is, how our experience with color is coded into our language. And the third conclusion of Berlin and Kay was the fact that color names may be more than more a direct function of perceptual phenomena than determining that precept. That is, that the color names are driven by perception, not the other way around. Um, in a more recent set of studies, a, a related set of studies, uh, Heider and Roche, which are the different names in the literature, it is the same person. The first was her single name, and the second was her married name. So Heider and Roche, R-O-S-C-H, if you see it in the literature, are actually referring to the same people. And what she did was to study native speakers of Dani, which, like the Basa that we talked about earlier, um, is, a, is a language group that has two different color names. In that instance, it is Mola, which refers to the bright, warm colors, orange, yellow, red, and Millie, which refers to the dark or the cool colors, blue, purple, uh, and green. Um, what she did was to use a, a recognition test, and what she demonstrated was the recognition accuracy of focal colors, as identified by the other investigators, was much greater and more consistent than the recognition by those people of accuracy of non-focal colors. So there is something about the spectrum itself and colors that all perceivers tend to identify as primary. Um, now, what you'd expect, basically, is that if a language sometimes determines, a, if language determines perception, which is what linguistic relativity is arguing, then those, language, the, those languages that distinguish with only two color names would have more difficulty recognizing both focal and non-focal colors because of vagueness in, in naming. But no such difference was found. There is not that difference. The, the, um, rather, the conclusion is that the focal colors are very similar for all members uh, in all different language groups. That represents a very serious challenge to linguistic relativity. Um, and we have to use a lot of caution in interpreting evidence regarding the linguistic relativity hypothesis because it's not a simple hypothesis and the implications for language and its source and use are also quite serious. But one of the, one of the subjects that this then leads into is, is studies um, related to 
essentially culture, the interplay between culture and the words that are used. Maybe it is that two words are used simply because color isn't very important in a particular society. But the, what some psycholinguists have done is to look at the relationship between the culture itself and the language and how certain basic elements are used. For instance, um, as this, uh, we're, we're going to talk about English, for instance, at a very basic level here. We're going to talk about it in terms of three elements. S, as I'm going to be using it here in the next several tables, refers to the subject of the sentence. V refers to the verb of the sentence. And O refers to essentially the direct object of the sentence, that is the object. So we've got subject, verb, and object. Actor, action, and that to which it is targeted. And so in English, the obvious preference is SVO. That is, we tend to, in a declarative sentence, we use it subject, verb, and object, so that you see a sentence like, uh, the boy likes the girl, perfectly comfortable for you. We have to add a lot of other words if we want to do it in any other way and maintain the same degree of clarity. So for us, for English speakers, the, the preferred order is simply S-V-O. Greenberg actually studied natural languages around the world in terms of these concepts, subject, verb, and object, and demonstrated some rather interesting things. What he, what he first of all looked at is what are the preferred or what are the sequences that are available. Given that we've got three terms, mathematically there are six different possible orders that can be utilized as illustrated on the screen there. So SOV and SVO are illustrated by very minor differences. But if we take a sample couple of sentences, English is in the second group there. The boy likes the girl. That's in the SVO order. Okay? The SOV order, which actually turns out among the world's languages, is more popular would have the sentence, and I'm doing this in English, and clearly it's not, it doesn't communicate exactly the same thing, but in the SOV order, it would be the boy the girl likes, okay, if you did it in SOV, all right? The second group of orders are where the verb precedes, and here you would get sentences like, such as, likes the boy, the girl, or likes the girl, the boy, and those are simply illustrative of the way in which English would be ordered if, in fact, we tended to use the VOS sequence, which we don't. And the final group, then, are those where the object precedes or starts the sentence. And in that case, then, you'd have the girl likes the boy and or the girl the boy likes. Notice, in these two word orders, the OVS order is the exact reverse of the preferred order in English. So in some languages, if you translated it directly to English, you'd end up thinking we were talking about a preference of the girl rather than a preference of the boy. Because in that case, putting the subject um, at, uh, at the end of the sequence instead of the beginning makes that, in our order, our language rules, the, the, uh, the direct object of the sentence. So in fact, word order does have an impact. In addition, <coughs> excuse me, one of the other things that these investigators looked at is, well, okay, how popular are each of these different word orders. And when you look at it, it's rather amazing. That is that, that uh, the subject starting the sentence accounts for fully 79% of all of the languages of the world. That is, of the, of the hundred or so that were studied here, um, the, the um, subject preceding actually generates, uh, describes 79% of the languages. English, is, the order in English, then, is actually second most preferred, not the top order in terms of world use of, of language. Interestingly, if we then look at verb leading first, um, the VSO and VOS sequences, that accounts for the other 21%. So, in fact, there is no language in the world that actually organizes itself where the object of the sentence, the target of the action, starts the, the, um, the sequence. The last two should probably not be much of a surprise, but, it, but essentially no language then starts with the object. Um, and uh, the remaining 21% start with the action rather than the subject of the sentence itself. And again, there's consistency in how cognition normally occurs. Actions are initiated or performed by subjects. Who did what to whom seems a perfectly natural sequence to use for speakers of English. Yet, who to whom did what is the most popular order in the world's languages. So the English, given its natural seemingness to us, is actually in the second most preferred order among all the languages in the world. Could it be that international difficulties in negotiations in, street, in, in uh, treaties and so forth may in fact be at, large, at least partly a function of the, um, 
of the languages themselves which are being utilized. As you saw in the example earlier, the SOV versus the VOS order, um, I'm sorry, SVO versus OVS order, uh, it's simply transposing what our normal word order would be. So if some, a treaty writer is writing in terms of a language that does the reverse order, um, there's an obvious difficulty that could occur. Um, which leads in turn to a number of different questions, uh, such as, if we come back to the linguistic relativity hypothesis, what is the origin of our lexical units? Is, is essentially what's at issue with the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Why do the Eskimos have snow named in so many different ways of white, where English speakers differentiate it with so few? Why is it that language is so different in those two ways? Why do US-based speakers of English have so many names for types of automobiles, while Laplanders have only one or two, a very limited number of things referring to the four-wheel vehicles that we love and roam all over our country in. Could it be that, a more, that, that the more significant an experience is to us, the more the number of ways in which our language expresses it? That is, when something is an important element of our everyday life, our language then follows and expresses it in a lot of different ways. It's possible. That would argue the exact reverse of what the linguistic relativity hypothesis is asserting. That is, that our precepts, to, to our percepts determine our language. That's the exact reverse of what the, the um, uh, linguistic relativity hypothesis is suggesting. It's argued then by the data that we've gone over there that cultural needs drive development of specific language codes. Language is dependent on cultural needs, not the other way around. A speaker learning his or her language code is, is accompanied by learning the significant cultural values of a society, some of which may be related to cultural physical survival. So in fact, what's being argued here is that, that language doesn't drive thought, it's actually the other way around. Needs determine what language is, is ultimately created, which in turn then leads us into finally getting to the earlier announced section 18, at which point now we'll simply look at bilingualism. Um, a group, Hoffman, Lau, and Johnson in 1986, tested linguistic relativity among bilinguals. Um, and in essence, in, in leading into it to, to understand the basis for the studies that they did, chi there is a, chi a term in Chinese called shigu, S-H-I, one word, second word, G-U, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which describes someone who is, is worldly, experienced, socially skillful, devoted to his or her family, and somewhat reserved, okay? There is no such word precisely in English. I mean, I had to string together about eight or ten of them to create or convey to you the concept of shigu as it is, is expressed in, in Chinese. So there's no such term in English. Um, Hoffman and colleagues basically wrote English and Chinese passages to describe the shigu stereotype. That is, they wrote about it without naming it per se in the essay that they, um, that they created. Um, with no use of the shigu phrase per se. And then what they did was to ask those who were fluent in both Chinese and English to read the paragraphs either in English or in uh, Chinese and then rate the likely truthfulness of various summary statements about the characters that had been talked about in terms of shigu in the paragraphs that were actually raised uh, or were, were written. And the statements clearly involved aspects of shigu in the paragraphs that were written. And what was found was that, that uh, subjects were much more likely to rate the various statements in terms of the shigu stereotype when passages heard in Chinese than in English. That is, when they had read the chapter, the, the paragraphs in Chinese, which includes the shigu concept as a word. People who were familiar with both Chinese and English were much more likely to summarize the work in terms of shigu um, when they had written it in, read it in Chinese rather than in English. Not saying that English speakers can't comprehend the Shigu stereotype. We're only saying here that when stereotypes have been primed, as the paragraphs did, it was more accessible to mental manipulation by the Chinese. Which raises several questions, one of which is, do people think differently in different languages? And in turn, that leads us then into a discussion of our, our focal concept here, and that is bilingualism. We define a bilingual, this is not going to be a particularly rough definition, you may not even have to write it down, as people who speak two languages. A related concept, as you'll see, a great intellectual leap here is to move then to a monolingual. Let me guess, that is a person who speaks but one language. 
So we've got bilingual and monolingual defined here, which in turn leads into um, some rather interesting concepts about the impact of language on thought and the reverse, because how you define bilingualism depends on what the impact of bilingualism is on the thinking based on the one or the both languages. And it leads to some rather interesting um, uh, assertions here. One concept we can talk about is what's called a balanced bilingual. This is for those who are equally fluent in two languages, who come from, from middle class background and show the positive effects of bilingual, by, of being bilingual. That is, bilingualism, when it's balanced, is something typically learned early and uh, a language in which the people who can do both are comfortable thinking in either language and are about equally likely, depending on who they're interacting with, to either speak in English or to speak in whatever the second language happens to be and even think that way. James Cummings, Cummins, sorry, no G there, um, distinguishes among two different types of bilingualism beyond the, the possibility of being a balanced uh, bilingual. One he talks about is what's called additive bilingualism, and what he means there is essentially someone who acquires a second language in addition to a well-developed first language. Any of us who have tackled, um, um, should back up there to a minute to focus on what we're talking about, I'll just leave it there. But in essence, uh, those of us who jumped into foreign language only when we got into elementary or middle or high school are examples of additive bilinguals, as if we've, if we've, been, if we've mastered a second language. In this case, by these definitions, we would be considered an additive bilingual. Subtractive bilingualism is essentially where parts of a second language replace elements in the first language. That can sometimes happen if somebody is, is anchored in a language and learns a second one and essentially begins to incorporate certain kinds of words into the original base language there. Um, it argues essentially that additive bilingualism, that is um, the um, investigator who did this, Cummins, is essentially arguing that additive bilingualism leads to increased cognitive functioning because you've now got one language, language added to a second one and it enriches the amount of, of bilingual functioning that is going on, the cognitive processing that's going on. The counter assertion is that subtractive bilingualism leads to decreased cognitive functioning. There is not as much cognition going on relative to how am I going to give expression to my thoughts. The evidence essentially suggests in, in um, uh, Cummins' work that a high level of competence in both languages is required in order to be able to demonstrate the positive effects of additive bilingualism. That is, when you have a first language and you add to it a second language, you have to really achieve true mastery, total mastery of that second language before you begin to get the enriched thought uh, processes that are possible with the, the bilingual approach. A second issue related to, to um, language processing then has to do with, well, okay, what are the effects of AIDS? age, can, can, can native-like mastery of a second language actually be achieved any time after adolescence? And again, the answer to that depends on how you're defining bi bilingualism. Harry Barrick uh, at Ohio Wesleyan, whom we talked about one time quite a while ago in terms of his studies of long-term memory, has also done some study of bilingualism and the function of age and its impact on our ability to, to learn. And what he finds is that the answer is yes, bilingualism will help in some ways. That is, um, in terms of, of um, age differences, there are none when we look at it in terms of mastering vocabulary comprehension. That is, our ability to simply master the words is not impacted by how old we are when we start that second language. It is also true that old and young alike can learn equally well to a given level of fluency in a particular language. The ability to, to um, acquire fluency in a language is not a function of the age at which you start it, but rather the amount of time, effort that you devote to, to practicing it. And there is even some evidence that syntactic flexibility, syntax skills, uh, can also be acquired well, regardless of age at, at which you start your studies. So at least in terms of vocabulary, uh, fluency or expression, and syntax, doesn't matter when you start studying the language. The one place where there is a detrimental function of starting it less, or older, I should say, is that you tend to learn less well proper pronunciation. So the actual pronunciation of the language may not occur as well um, um, by somebody who starts learning the language older. You may have uh, met people in this country, for instance, who come in with, with, a, um, with what is their original language, whether it be Chinese or Irish or anything else, 
Uh, and if you listen to them, there is a very heavy, for instance, an Irish person, there is a very heavy brogue in their English, even though the English is just as rich here uh, as it was in the, in the British Isles. But the, we get kind of anchored in the way in which we grow up. Um, and the net effect is that, that uh, there are elements of that language that stay with us, and it, it relates to properly pronouncing the words that you're, um, that you're talking about. So it's not surprising in a way that the pronunciation of new phonemes uh, in a language is easier than mastering phonemes similar to ones in the one that you've previously learned. That is, you, you get anchored in your base language, and the minor nuances of what you stress or don't stress uh, become much more difficult to, to master. Um, there are even songs in the literature about tomato, tomato, potato, potato, and so forth and so on. Those are the minor nuances of, of a language that typically an older person will just not respond to, not pick up on, uh, in the same way that a younger person learning language actually will. Which leads us back to the original point for getting into all this, and that is, how are the two languages represented? That is, if we, if we look at linguistic relativity in a single language, how do we actually represent two languages when we're blessed with, with being able to speak each of the two of them? Um, this has very important implications for processing language when we're interacting in terms of, of if you think in the language that you're processing, your reaction time to questions in that language is more rapid than if you think in one and have to translate to the other in order to answer questions. So that basically one of the things we can look at is differences here in terms of reaction time and from your reaction time based on the question in which we've asked it, sorry, based on the language in which we've asked you the question, your reaction time to respond will give us a very good hint as to which language you're actually using for doing the thinking. And it is quite clear that if you use two languages, um, the, the, um, the reaction times take longer. Uh, which leads then to two predictions by, uh, by Paradise in, in a 1981 paper in which what uh, was being talked about there is what he called a single system hypothesis, which is essentially that two languages are represented in just one system. So you're storing the words in, in a, a similar structure, hierarchy, and so forth. The other possibility is what's called a dual system hypothesis, where two languages are represented in two separate systems in the mind. You can maybe predict where this is headed. Because now what we can do is look at reaction time in terms of telling us where the, whether these two systems are equally accessible or not, given that we now have two languages. Are they stored right next to each other? Are they stored separately in the brain in some way? And so uh, what we can then predict from these two hypotheses is that uh, knowledge of Tamil, for instance, which is an Indian language, might be stored in a physically separate area of the brain than English, if those are the two languages that you have learned. We study this by essentially analyzing performance of bilingual individuals with brain damage. So we're adding a, a second feature here. But essentially, the, the question that's going to be asked here is, does such a person, as we'd expect, show different amounts of impaired function in different languages? The basis for that is essentially that if you've got damage in a particular area of the brain and the two languages are actually stored, in different areas of the brain, the expectation would be then that whichever language is more stored in whatever is the injured area of your head will demonstrate deteriorated reaction times because the, the processing area has been more destroyed in one as opposed to the other language. We can perhaps indicate the, the differential storage of the two languages by differential reaction times to problems posed in one as opposed to the other language. Um, that's easy to explain logically. I mean, it makes a great deal of sense. It is much more difficult to demonstrate experimentally. I mean, the, the logic is pretty clear about how to look at two different languages and reaction time to problems posed in one or the other. Actually doing so gets to be a lot more difficult because studying recovery of language after trauma um, leads to, to essentially equi equivocal results though it tends to favor two different locations. In other words, the results are a little mixed, but in general what the data tends to suggest is that two different languages learned separately are in fact stored differently in the brain, that is in two different areas. Um, studying patients with epilepsy and applying, for instance, mild electrical shock um, in certain areas inhibits brain function. So we apply stimulation when the patient is asked to name objects, for instance, a very simple process to do. And if inhibition occurs at the site where the object names are stored, this offers an opportunity to study object naming in each language by comparing the reaction times. We find, actually, that some areas show equal impairment in each language. Okay, 
So the logic here is that brain damage is going to lead to unequal um, impairment in the two languages. And if we look at epilepsy and mild electric brain stimulation, the results that we get then tend to suggest two things. First of all, some areas are essentially equal in terms of that is processing of certain kinds of information in each language is essentially equal, show equal impairment. Um, other areas showed greater improvement in one language or in the other. Again, equivocal results in terms of what we're looking at here. We should note, though, that another thing that was found that is not surprising is that the weaker language was more diffusely represented across the brain than was the stronger one. That is, it's it spread out further across the, uh, across the brain. I'm thinking back to the work that we looked at much earlier in the semester uh, relative to uh, um, uh, chess experts' ability to look at a board and organize it or, you know, look at it and then reproduce it from memory. They've got a, a, a set of rules that they've, they've learned over the years which aid in the organization of the information. And language tends to follow this in, in that the weaker, the less well-learned language tends to be spread out more diffusely across the entire head. And yet some aspects of each language may be represented singly, that is in only a single storage space, um, where the others are, are represented quite separately or, or diversely. Let me lead into three major cautions to be aware of in this situation as we start looking at the relation between lesions and, or as we finish our, our look at the relationship between lesions and, and language. The first is that naturally occurring lesions often are not limited to specific precise regions of the brain. A cancer or an accident may intrude into any particular portion of the brain without any respect to what function is served by the particular neurons that are impacted in that kind of a situation. In other words, the, the lesions don't follow either brain geography or brain function. They simply grow, okay? That's a problem. The second problem is um, that um, we can, um, I'm behind myself here, that in this essence, the difficulty with studying lesions after the fact is we don't have a measure of how good the language skills were of the person preceding the occurrence of the lesion. So we have no before group to make a now and then comparison. There's no then measure that's available uh, to us in, in this particular situation. And finally, we're unable to create lesions where we'd like them. Want to volunteer for a brain study? Well, obviously not. So when we're dealing with lesions in terms of illness and that kind of thing, we can only deal with what nature happens to offer us in that situation. Um, and in those areas where, where the lesions happen to strike what we're interested in, that can be fine. But the other areas um, it, it can't be controlled. There may be other things that, in fact, inadvertently impact what we're talking about here. So the study of, of naturally occurring lesions is filled with some degree of risk, basically, is, is the point that I'm making here. We conclude, essentially, that two languages share some, but not all, aspects of mental representation. That is, there's a blend. Sometimes they're exactly on top of each other. Other times they're stored in very different areas. The benefits of learning second language is greatest when it supplements initial language learning. That is, when you can piggyback it on top and ultimately make it an additive uh, combination. For maximum benefit, uh, for maximum beneficial effects, that second language needs to be well-learned or even overlearned. And I've talked previously about the benefit of, of starting language studies very early so that it, is, it has never occurred to you that it is, oh, a second language I'm learning. Uh, when you're one or two, you're not processing it that way. You're just thinking, oh, isn't that interesting? Two different ways to say the same thing. Uh, learning a language early is, is simply much less effort required to, to, to achieve it. Um, it should be extended, however, to point out that bilingualism is not the only, the only potential outcome here. That is, there are, there are some other bilingual mixes that can be achieved. Um, and I'm realizing as I start into this that I had an example I meant to look up to identify precisely. I'll describe it when I'm done here, but I won't be able to use the details I'd wanted to. One of the types of other bilingualism that is actually occurs is a kind of an unusual admixture of two different languages, and that is what's called creolized language, one of several forms of bilingualism. What this is is a type of mixed language that develops when dominant and subordinate groups that speak different languages have prolonged contact. The net result is that at least one of those groups will tend to incorporate the basic vocabulary of the dominant language with the grammar and an admixture of words from the subordinate language. And what, what happens then is that that becomes the native tongue of the subordinate group. Okay? 
So if you've got a, a, a major language and a sub-language group that is, is injected into that society, if there's a long enough contact, what tends to happen to that second group if they don't master the first language is that they pull in some of the grammar of the, of the new language and it gets fitted into the vocabulary and, and uh, structure, word structure, um, syntax is the word I'm looking for, of the minor language, the second language. That is what's called creole, creolized language. The second possibility, which is slightly different, is instead to look at pidgin, which is a simplified version of speech, usually a mixture of two or in some cases three or more languages that has a rudimentary grammar and vocabulary and is used for communication between groups that actually speak different languages. Okay? These two occur, both of the, the um, creolized and, and pidgin language occur um, when the two language groups contact each other um, another possibility occurs when a single language blends or changes in form, okay? So that in essence, um, the, the, the first two essentially occur when two language groups meet each other, and the third one is a case where, where a single language may blend or change in form. And that leads us to looking at what is called dialect, which is essentially a regional variety of a language um, that, that is distinguished by features such as vocabulary, or in some cases syntax or even pronunciation. These are basically what we would refer to as harmless regional variations. Okay? The particular thing I wanted to cite for you was an unusual social situation that developed off the coast of, of South Carolina um, about 150 years ago. There was a group of, of natives, essentially Native Americans, uh, Indians, um, who were isolated on the, the Channel Islands, the outer islands along the coast of South Carolina. And the English, um, and I've forgotten the, I should not have even mentioned this, but in essence what happened was, of course, English was the dominated language, but that group, after extensive interaction on the mainland, retreated to the island because of what was going on socially and, and in terms of the language and everything. And what they end up speaking now is very old English. Uh, they have actually, they, they were speaking the language that was typical 200 years ago here, retreated to the barrier islands, the outer islands, um, and the net result is the English that they speak is, is essentially what was being spoken in old England um, 200 years ago now. So it's, it's a case where they retreated from, they were, the language of the group was modified by the, the contact language, and then they retreated to the island, and what's been preserved there is a very old traditional form of, of English thickly enough spoken that it is difficult to understand if you're not aware of the, of the language process that has gone on. Um, these are, are, as I said, regional variations that are involved here. They seldom yield serious communication difficulties, but can create confusion under certain kinds of situations. Dialects lose none of the basic language's ability to communicate, but they may have negative social status. That is, if you speak a heavy dialect in certain areas of the country, you're just kind of automatically put down if you're not speaking good English uh, in some sense. Which leads then to another act that we're going to be involved with here, to speak perchance to influence, and that is the act of, of speaking. There are a number of different speech acts that are, that are captured in this, um, in this work. Um, and basically the, the study that I'm going to be talking about here was conducted by John Searle, um, who actually identified a number of different um, a theory of speech acts in which he tried to identify very specific examples of the different ways in which you and I communicate with each other. Um, in, in a 1975 book, he wrote about, uh, about five or six different, I think there's six if I remember correctly, different types of speech, one of which is what's called representative speech. This is speech that is basically an act in which you convey a belief that a given proposition is true. So you're hearing representative speech. If you hear, if you hear me make a statement like, today it's cloudy uh, and there's a 40% chance of rain. You've heard people make statements like that all the time. Today it's clear there's not a chance that it's going to rain and so forth. Um, such assertions, such assertions, that's a mouthful, may vary in their verifiability, but they are at heart statements of belief. That is, anybody that makes a statement like, it's cloudy, and there's a 40% chance of rain, they offer it to you without trying to lie to you or anything like that. They're not prevaricating. They're simply stating their particular belief in a, um, in a particular subject matter. This can include qualifiers that may label the degree of certainty. Witness 40% chance of rain. You're telling somebody, well, it's above zero, but it's not certain by any means that it's going to rain. You're saying essentially, I'm essentially positive, reasonably certain. Okay? 
It's a form of language assertion that was the source of some bit of pressure put on you when you were studying English in high school. Do you remember hearing your high school teachers say, encourage you to delete things from your essays like personally? It always seemed to me very important to state that when I was writing an essay. I believe. Well, in fact, um, statements like personally and I believe and it seems to me are redundant. They are simply repeating the fact that you're doing the writing. Who else's beliefs would it be on the paper? Well, I'm actually copying that off somebody else. You know, it just it doesn't make sense in one sense when you're writing to say personally because statements are, are simply assumed to be representative. They represent your thoughts on a given matter. The words that you actually use will alter the way in which the receiver interprets what you're actually saying. But it is very clear that the, that the essential element here is that it's your belief when you make a statement like, it's cloudy out. Um, a second type of, of sentence that is described, or, or type of communication, is a directive statement. This is one where you make an attempt to get a listener to do something, such as answering a question. Okay, so directive statements can be questions. They, in fact, may be statements in some, in some situations. Things like, you know, if somebody is on the street trying to beg money from you, when as you walk past them, they, a typical opening is something like, can I talk to you? Can I talk with you for a minute? Or have you got a minute? And so forth. Or, more directly, can you loan me 50 cents, a dollar? I was I actually hit up one time for five dollars. They were standing outside the Starbucks, but uh, when I talked to him, it was actually after a drink at the bar that was across the street. But in essence, the startup is essentially an attempt to, to get you to do something. And so that's the, the form of a directive, essentially. Um, you're, you're asking, essentially, what the, the person is asking you, do you have time to talk with me? And you answer that, yay or nay. The form can vary, but the intent is, is very similar among all those, and that is to get the listener, the person that you target with that kind of a statement, to do something to do something with you or for you um, or, or some kind of uh, interaction. The effect, in some cases, can be quite indirect. That is, we can, we can illustrate a directive statement full of subtlety. In the following situation, I have a, a friend, Ann Weber, who is a psychologist at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. And she came here to talk to my introductory classes one time and provided a classic example of what would be considered a directive statement. Because what had happened was that she and two other friends formed a kind of a triumvirate in, in school. And as it turned out on a particular day, one of the two friends that she knew had invited the other of two friends that she knew to that friend's house. So among the three, two had been invited to one's house. And they were there when Ann, who was not expected to be there, had, had been expected to be you know, on a family trip or something, not there, all of a sudden shows up at the friend's house. Okay, the mom had offered the two kids who were already there a bowl of ice cream. And Ann came in as third friend, not shunned in any way, but simply excluded because of the fact that the, you know, the two bowls were already out and mom had served up what she had. I mean, she had no more ice cream uh, in that situation. And Ann wanted some, but was really too shy to point blank ask, can I have ice cream? So what she did instead was to look at the ice cream with drooling things down her mouth and said essentially, I think that's a really delicious looking dish of ice cream. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And the implication, of course, in, in her mind was quite clear. Her point was simply how indirect and obtuse we can be when we really want to say, can I have some ice cream, but we're shy. Boy, that's a really good looking dish of ice cream you've got there. Hint, hint, hint. Um, third type are those that involve commission of some sort, what are called commissive statements. In this case, uh, what, you, what you're after is a commitment to engage in some future course of action. You're obligating yourself to do something in a particular uh, situation. Um, and it can, it, can, it can take a variety of relatively complex forms. If you look at contract language, contracts are a good example of commissive communication because you are, in a sense, in a sense trying to communicate to each person so that they both agree on precisely what the meaning is of the contract. And that's the reason you end up with these fine print contracts that run on for pages, just to agree, I'm going to borrow that money and pay it back to you monthly at an interest rate of 7% uh, once a month with declining interest and increasing uh, payment on, on principal. But what you get is something that sounds like the party of the first part, here and after called the company, and the party of the second part, here and after called the contractor, dot, 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 and then they will go on for days and days, well, not pages, 
of legalese. And basically all they're trying to spell out is precisely what materials are going to be used, what the alteration is going to be to the structure, and a timeline by which it'll be done, and what the money is that'll be paid if that is all agreed to. And in fact, you may remember one benefit of that kind of specification was when the uh, Pierce Elevated in Houston was, was replaced about 10 years ago now. You may or may not have been here when that happened, but as you can imagine, that was a total colossal chaos for traffic in Houston. When they, when they were altering it, and it, it had gotten to the point where it was distinctly bumpy between the various concrete pillars. And so what they did was put together a contract with all of those specifics, but they added to it a bonus. And the bonus was for every day early, you know, they negotiated a fair contract, this, can, this work can be done in this much time. What they added was a very generous multi-thousand dollar bonus per day early that the project was finished. And in that case, because of the impact on the city economically, there was a whopping penalty daily for every day late that they were delayed. And the net result was that that thing was brought in ahead of schedule in excess of specifications by a month on a five, if I remember it, it was a five month contract and they actually delivered it in four months and then repeated it when they did the other side. And if you drive on that thing today, 10 years later, it's a little bumpy, but pretty straight and does the job. But in essence, it was the details of that contract. That would have been a classic example of a commissive statement, one that laid out the, the details on which the, the contractor would be working in that particular situation. Another kind of, of statement, uh, or oh, in, in addition, I should also indicate things like promises, pledges, contracts that we've already talked about, guarantees, assurances, all illustrate various examples of commissive statements where you're essentially signing to or agreeing to obligating yourself to some kind of an action or another. The next type then are expressive statements. These are basically statements regarding your, that is the speaker's, um, psychological state, how you feel in a given situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these are sentences that start with things like, um, I'm happy you succeeded, or I'm sad, or it worries me that, and they label whatever it is that is the, um, is the problem. Uh, therein lies a very interesting example of communicating with, with kids. Because when, when, um, when, when five-year-olds slug one another, they have done so by watching cartoons. I can remember my now 17-year-old, when he was about three, used to look at Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and they, of course, clobber each other all the time, never get hurt. And, of course, those things only show the fight, not the effects of a fight. And I can remember as I watched him as a five-year-old once way into a group, fully intent upon doing mayhem on somebody's head when he was carrying one of the swords that they used to, uh, to market. And it was just a matter of not yet having the, the, um, uh, the, the knowledge of, of the effects of such aggression, which are so often shown on television. But if you think about it, one of the major objections to the observational power of television on us is the fact that the actions are shown, but the consequences very seldom are shown. And that tends to make us think that it's much less harmful to slug somebody than, in fact, it typically is. Um, but in any case, the point that I was going to make is that, that if you've got a five-year-old that slugs another one, and mom asks, you know, well, how do you think so-and-so felt when you hit him? And you're the, you, the kid, are saying, oh, pretty good. Because, in fact, uh, you felt so good when you slugged him. It vindicated you in some way. Mom frowns, and you begin to think in processing as quickly as you can, may not be the right answer. Let's try another one. Well, maybe not so good. Mom grins a little bit more or groans a little bit less, and you finally get around to not very good, I guess. Right, Johnny. The difficulty there is that that person is processing something that they do not understand because they are not yet other-oriented. Five-year-olds are consummately self-centered. Okay, that's all they worry about. That's all they're supposed to worry about is, is getting through their meal, doing correctly what they need to, and so forth. Net result, all they're worried about is themselves. And so when you ask them something like, how do you think so-and-so felt? They literally do not have the linguistic ability to make anything other than an expressive statement, which is me. It's how I feel about it, and that is the hang-up. So expressive statements are pretty much all you expect out of a five-year-old. They can't assume your point of view and talk about things. It can only be their own point of view and how they weigh in on, on uh, how they feel in a given situation. Um, another type is what is called a uh, declarative or performance-oriented sentence. And in this case, what we're looking at is essentially a verbal expression in which the very act of making a statement brings about an intended new state of affairs. Okay? All of this work, the five that I've talked about there, are summarized in, in Sternberg's uh, Cognitive Psych book, 2005.
But in essence, what we're talking about here, the, the declarative performative statements, which are performance-oriented statements, which are the last of the ones that I am um, talking about here. The, the word actually should not be performance, but performative. Uh, there's a spelling error in there. Drop the A-N-C-E and put in T-I-V. Uh, but these are performative statements, essentially. The, you may remember this country western song, Take This Job and Shove It. That's an example of a, of a declarative statement, a performative statement, telling you what you can do with that statement. When I am particularly perturbed at a company and I am communicating with them, one of the closing lines that I like to use is, you can take this policy or whatever we've been talking about and shove it up your corporate inbox, which is a very indirect way of saying essentially the same thing. Um, another one that has that effect is, I quit. That's a declarative statement. A member of a group who has been ignored or, or, you know, not been paid attention to for a long period of time eventually just says, I quit, and walks out. Um, I, the best example in my own life of that was I used to uh, teach, uh, do a workshop. I did a workshop for high school teachers of psychology in upstate New York at one of the SUNY campuses. Um, it was a summer group. We had about 30 high school teachers of psychology, which is generally junior seniors that are taking the course in that. Uh, and we were using an activity to show all the different elements that go into communication. And in that case, what was involved was putting on seven people's forehead a taped signal that told everybody else in the group how to interact with them. So if they reacted or offered something to the group, it didn't matter whether it was right on topic, totally off topic, you simply read the label on their head in order to know how to deal with them. And so in essence, one of the tapes said, agree with me. Another one said, disagree with me. Another one said, amplify, meaning essentially take what I've said and build on it. And another one that was the trick said, ignore me. To make it work, when you set the groups of seven up, you put ignore me on the most gregarious, outgoing, high output verbal person in the group. And it has a very predictable effect each time. This particular time in running this, you give people, normally you set up groups of seven, run it about 30 minutes, and give the groups collectively an impossible topic to resolve. Um, a statement, marijuana should be legalized. Well, that's going to take any group and split it. Okay, I mean, it's, it's just guaranteed to generate arguments because there are a lot of persuasive arguments both ways. We are one of the major societies in the country that doesn't permit marijuana, and yet the evidence in terms of the cumulative effects of marijuana are much lower than the cumulative effects of alcohol. And yet our society allows alcohol to be sold, but it prohibits the sales of, of marijuana, except under very stringent medical conditions. So there's an obvious, immediate argument there. And that's the purpose, because the, the goal in that particular discussion, although the group is assigned to reach an absolute unified group decision in 30 minutes, it can't be done. And the choice of the topic is intended to ensure this. So in any case, in this particular summer shop, workshop, what I did was to put together such a, a series of demonstration groups and that topic to debate. And the ignore me label went on one, one very gregarious, outgoing, well-liked teacher. And he was wearing without, nobody knew, of course, what was on their own forehead. He had the ignore me label. And about 30 minutes, about 25 minutes into the group, it had gotten louder and louder in the group that he was in because he kept trying to shout louder as if he wasn't being heard. And eventually, at one point in the discussion, he got up, stood up on the chairs that were drawn in a circle, took off his shirt and started on his buckle and said, if you people don't listen to me, I'm going to take off the rest of my clothes. <laughs> and one of the other teachers, as cool as a cucumber, turned and said, now, what was your idea? And turned right back to the previous statement that had been made. But the, the impact is that, that those commissive statements, and the, particularly the expressive and declarative ones, can be very revealing in terms of what's actually going on in here among the contributing members in a, um, in, in, in a group. Perhaps the most life-altering, permanent life-altering group uh, statement of the declarative type is, I now pronounce you husband and wife. That is the ultimate uh, performative uh, statement. Um, now, we can also look at, at speech in another way, and that is in terms of, essentially, um, what would be called the, a variety of different indirect speech acts. And, and you've probably never thought about these, but you're going to identify them immediately when I show you what I'm talking about here. And this is uh, drawn across a number of different uh, people's work. Um, Mary Naus in our department, Justin Lieber in, in philosophy, and, and Garson, Ann Garson, and, and so forth. Um, but in essence, the, the four types of, of statements that can be, that can be analyzed or, or identified, essentially, involve 
four different types of, of goals or, or things factored into the statements themselves. One of these is ability. When somebody asks you, can you tell me what time it is, they are not expecting you to look at them and say, uh, yeah. Because what's being asked there is not um, a, a direct yes or no question. Yes or no is not the answer that we're looking for there. What we're expecting people to do is say, sure, it's, and they look at their wristwatch and, and then explain to you what the time is. But if you just try that sometime and say yes, then they, if it's no, then the answer is, I don't have a watch or I can't see the clock from where I'm sitting either, or something like that. But if it's yes, that's not an appropriate answer. It is expected, it is, it is expected that you're, you're, what you're really being asked there is about your ability to do so uh, and your willingness to do so, not, not physically uh, do you have the ability. Um, the second type of this statement is, are those that are involved in desire. Okay. Have you ever closed a letter with something fancy like thanking you in advance for your attempt to honor this request? Is really nothing more than an attempt to assure that the, quest, the request will in fact be honored because you, you've pre-advanced your, your thanks to them on the assumption that they're going to do what has been asked. But what you're clearly also trying to do is stack the death increasingly in favor of the fact that whatever you have requested, they will in fact do in a given situation. Um, you can also ask questions that basically involve future action in one way or another. Will you be there? You're talking about a party that's going on Friday night or a movie that a sorority is, is sponsoring or anything like that. One member turns to another and essentially asks, will you be there? It's an essentially an attempt on the part of them to, to, first of all, determine whether you will be there, but also to it slightly nudges you in favor of, I'm going to be here, will you be there? Because clearly they wouldn't be interested in knowing whether you were there if they weren't going to be there. So there are actually several different things that are being said and communicated in that future action statement. Will you be there? It, it binds you to the process, but it also states implicitly, I'm going to be there. Will you be there? And finally then, statements that involve citing reasons in a variety of ways. I need to get there. Does not do anything but imply a reason. When you said something like, I need to be there. <coughs> We don't know what it is, we just know that it's, it's vital. Every now and then when a student is not going to be able to take an exam, forgetting the fact that we draw, drop the lowest exam, which is the whole reason we do that, so we don't have to worry about excuses. It puts less pressure on, on grandparents to remain alive during the testing season um, and things like that. Uh, you know, the answer is sometimes offered, is, or the, the justification is, is no more offered than simply, it's important that I be at my grandmother's on Saturday. Well, I don't know why. It might be the 70th anniversary. It might be they're about to die. Uh, it, it's hard to know. But, but the implication there is that the, you're, you're essentially citing a reason when you simply say, I need to get there. I need to be there. Um, others have demonstrated that, that such indirect speech acts as, as the four that I've mentioned there as samples often anticipate potential ob ob objections or, or obstacles that are likely to be cited uh, by the person who's being addressed. So in some cases, these, these indirect speech acts are actually being used to, to, to blunt or, or deflect a problem before it becomes one, essentially, that you're doing it in, in that way. Um, often raised in such a way to respond to those problems before they're actually raised. So you, you couch the language in such a way that, that it's hard to then raise the issue because you've already provided a counterexample. Uh, another classic when you're trying to get somebody to go somewhere is, can I pick you up? So now already the idea of, well, my car's in the shop, uh, it's too far, you've blunted it by, uh, can I pick you up that night? Uh, can I be there at 7? And so forth. Um, my ex-wife had a classic question. It took me several years to learn what she was really saying, but every now and then, because she is very temperature, temperature sensitive, she would say to you, um, don't you feel cool? What I finally learned was that what she was really saying in that particular situation is, I feel cool, please shut the door or the window or whatever. But it was done indirectly, graciously, in terms of, don't you feel cool? Well, what was really being stated in that situation was, I'm cool, would you mind shutting the window or altering the temperature or whatever? So the indirect speech acts are really focusing on the fact that in some cases, at face value, the communication that has been offered to us is not stating or communicating exactly what the, what the word for word translation would communicate. That, if you'll remember, was the difficulty that we have with machine translation of language. 
because the spirit of a question may be quite different from the actual words that are utilized. Every now and then when I get frustrated with the, uh, the I mean, there are quicker ways to get through it, but you call into a, a uh, I've got a package at UPS, right? Well, I shouldn't say that sentence. I, at that company I didn't name, which was express mailed to me last Thursday. It is uh, Thursday as I'm talking. I still don't have it because they sent it to my home with a must-be-signed, the sender sent it with a must-be-demined insignia uh, on it. I work at the U of H. I'm not there during the business hours ever. So, well, can we send it to the U of H? Well, okay. So I gave them an address, uh, and it was just, you know, Department of Psychology, University of Houston. Everybody else in the world can find that. They ended up downtown at the administrative headquarters for the system because their system requires, by George, that we have a street address there. I've never used a street address. I've been here 32 years, and I just signed it, Department of Psychology, University of Houston. The mail always gets here. Not that package. It's a week so far. We'll see how long it takes. Um, I'm off topic, clearly. Um, one of the other features of language is that it is very clearly a cooperative enterprise. You may or may not be aware of the incredible number of signals that are going back and forth between people when they're communicating with each other. There's a lot of cueing that we do of, of these things. Um, and it's an inherently cooperative adventure. In order for you and I just to stand there and talk to each other, we have to cue each other a lot, partly so that there are not long gaps during which I'm waiting for you to say something additional or you're waiting for me to say something additional. There are a lot of different cues that we use to actually let you know what my current expectation is, what your current expectation is. Um, H.P. Grice in 1967 argues that successful con conversation is actually based on four different maxims or rules of operation, if you want to think about it that way. One of them has to do with quantity. That is, when you and I are talking to one another, um, what you're essentially arguing is, or that you're talking in terms of the idea, that your conversational contribution should be just as informative as necessary, but no more informative than is appropriate in a given situation. In other words, we should provide just enough information to get the question answered. Given the number of students I normally have, particularly in the small fall semester, I am sometimes processing as much as 125 emails a day during the, during the part of the semester. And when I get a message that says, did you get my email, with no other bounds around it, I don't know. I mean, it may have come in, but I'm not going to take the time to scan back over six pages of single-line messages to answer that question. That's a case where not enough information has been given. The quantity of the, provided with the question hasn't been provided. Sometimes when I'm negotiating with people like taking an alternate exam or something like that, it may take several days of communications, particularly if the TA that you're supposed to contact hasn't responded properly. And I'll often get a, uh, a statement simply about, can I take this exam at that time? I don't know. What are the circumstances? So I've got, to, I've got, I haven't been given enough information in that case. Um, my favorite in terms of that, and I think I've talked about this once before, is when you give a telephone number, don't mumble. Don't do it on a cell phone when you're going into a dead space. So you get, call me back at 713-8321. I've listened 10 times sometimes. I can't translate it. The quantity in that case is either too rapid or not sufficient for the message to get through. Um, when you meet somebody in the hallway, classic example, we often say to each other, how are you? Or hi, or something like that. But when you say, when somebody passes you in the hallway and says, how are you? That is not giving you permission to dump core memory on everything that's happened to you since yesterday at four. Okay? All it's really doing is recognizing you exist. Okay? How are you? All we expect and all you ever say is fine. Or Lousy, my dog died. Oh, good. Oh, too bad. Because it's scripted. When somebody says, how are you, you're supposed to nod yes, because it's, life is good, you're still functioning, you don't have eggs spilled on your shirt or your tie, um, you had a good meal, and you're, you got to school on time. So, yeah, how are you? Fine. You've got bills that are overdue. Somebody is trying to repossess your car. I mean, you've got 17 different things you could stand there and talk to them about what's really going on. But all we're really doing when we say, how are you, is exactly what we're doing when we say, hi. We're saying, I see you. I acknowledge you as a valued fellow human. But when we say, how are you, we're saying, hi. We're not saying, tell me your life story. A second element, then, is the quality of what is actually exchanged in any given situation. Your contribution to a, to a conversation should be truthful. You're expected to say what you believe to be the case. 
again, without the personally or I believe, that isn't necessary. If you're speaking, it's assumed that it's personal, that it is your belief. A couple of years ago, I was crosswise with a merchant who had, had put something onto my credit card which was not supposed to be there. We had agreed it was not supposed to be there. Um, a lady from the credit card company called repeatedly to try and get that extra, because I'd paid the credit card off, but not that particular item. There was that dollar value that was just carrying every single month. And she called in one conversation near the end of the exchange, and in each time, you know, I, she presented her request, I provided my explanation. She then started her second thing, well, well, to be perfectly honest, and went off into a representation of what she'd said the first time. And I then said, I didn't pay it because we'd agreed the charge wasn't supposed to be there. It still is. I'm not going to pay it. Well, to be perfectly honest, three times she started her presentation with, well, to be perfectly honest, and I finally could not resist. And what I did was to say that when I am in a conversation on the phone, I'm always honest and forthright. It would never occur to me to be other than honest. And I'm just wondering why it is that she feels obligated to say, to be perfectly honest. The obverse, of course, would be, well, to be perfectly dishonest, which, of course, wasn't her intent. The result was she hung up. I had her name, though. <laughs> so in any case, the, uh, there are a lot of different things that may be going on in this case, but quality is assured, or it should be assured in a conversation. It should not be necessary. It's redundant, theoretically at least, to say to somebody, to be perfectly honest. The assumption is that we're honest in dealing with one another. Okay? Um, for, uh, thirdly, relationship is, is essentially involved. Your contribution to a conversation should be related and relevant to the aims of the conversation. You and I normally interact to find out when is the next exam, have the results been posted, uh, when is the project due, you know, this, that, and the other thing, but it's on target. I mean, you ask a question, and that pretty much specifies what we're going to interact with. And if I start talking about one of my cats and what he did this morning at home, that's irrelevant. It's, it's not relevant to the, to the discussion of exam date or, or anything else. Um, and so in essence, um, what you're off on in that case is um, kind of like I've done a couple of times this morning, in one case deliberately just so I can talk about it later, um, and that reminds me of a story, is essentially tangential. And you have to qualify it as such because otherwise people assume that the relation of what you're saying is direct to what's going on, not the result of a free association in your mind. And so in that case, um, you, you often will label it, I'm, I'm off on a tangent or I'm off topic here or something like that. And that, within limits, is permissible. It's allowed for people occasionally to wander off on something that is obviously personally of interest to them. And that's okay. We tolerate it in one another. We let people wander a little bit. But if it goes too far and for too long, um, even saying, but I digress, to bring it back, is not necessarily sufficient. So in a quality conversation, we're going to assume that there is, relative, there is a clear relation between what you're talking about and what the theme of the conversation itself is. The manner in which you address someone is also relevant. Okay? You have to try to avoid obscene expressions, vulgar utterances, and purposeful obfuscation of your point. Give you an example. The individual members of the ship's crew acted detrimentally to the espoused administrative purpose of the previously arranged oceanic voyage. What did they do? The individual members of the ship's crew acted detrimentally to the espoused administrative purpose of the previously arranged oceanic voyage. Mutinied. Yes, they mutinied. So instead of saying the individual members, da 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 da, all you have to do is say they mutinied. That is on target and the manner is efficient and communicates what needs to be communicated in that situation. Okay? Um, a first class piece of dead cow. Yeah, it's a steak. <laughs> well, it is dead. You don't want to eat it live. It is first class or you're less inclined to buy it. So in essence, the, the manner of the content has to be related in some significant way to the, to the conversation itself. And another implicit element of this is that when we're doing these conversations, we are essentially taking turns. Okay? We are taking turns. Conversation is really, truly a cooperative effort. Um, it can be indicated by a lot of different things, for instance, inflection. Okay? Um, what happened to the tone of my voice when I gave that as an example? When I said inflection, how did I intone it, up or down? 
down. What I said, again, directly was, conversation is a cooperative effort. It can be indicated by inflection. The fact that I toned down told you I was making a declarative statement. I did not expect you to say anything back in that situation, right? And the n in right is an invitation for you to speak. That is essentially a delimiter. When I finish something with an uplift in the tone, it is always at the end of a, a, a statement where I'm asking you to, I'm essentially saying, you know, I'm finished with what I'm saying. Do you agree? Or is this correct? Right? And that n is, is a nonverbal inflector. It's, it's an inflection that tells you it's your turn. So you've been kind of summarizing in your own head what I'm saying. And if I then do n, it essentially says, okay, I'm done. And you then launch in. A nod. You know, I've asked you, you know, should we have the test this week or next? And to me, I'm saying if you want it next week, we'll do it next week. If you want it this, don't take this seriously. But this, this is just an illustration of, of you know, if I, it, it's indicating that whatever we're talking about, I'm really quite neutral about what we, uh, what we do. My son and I sometimes get into indirect, uh, indirect con conversational cue competitions. When we have two restaurants we want to go to, both of which we're interested in, each of us is standing around kind of, you know, it's a matter of who does last that doesn't get to choose in that situation. Hand gestures. I've, I've just been using some there. I will point out, I cannot resist this. There are two major furniture advertisers in town. You know the two companies I'm talking about. One of the two spokesmen has been around for years, and it's a marvelous story how he went from the last thousand dollars of, of uh, ad money, which was the reason he did his own to save uh, uh, money, uh, at the end of his ad, always reaches into his back pocket and pulls out bills. Okay? The hand gestures in general are relevant, and there are not too many of them, but you know when he does this that he's about to pull the money out, so you also know by implication when this happens, the commercial is almost done. Okay, so this is almost an unintended cue for, yeah, that's what I'm going to save you, uh, but I'm almost done talking to you, too. The other one, who is the spokesman for the other company, if you watch his hands, they are amazingly unexpressive. He has two positions that he uses. Watch the next commercial. This, you're going to have to go to full picture to show me doing this. I'll wait. There we go. In one case, there are two positions when he's talking to us. And occasionally he'll put a variation. <laughs> but that's all there are. Now, that's just stylistic, but it's, it's just fascinating because the, the two companies are both very successful, and I'm sure you know the ones I'm talking about here in Houston. But the spokesmen are very different in the hand gestures that they actually use. Why I did this to indicate very different, who knows? Again, the, the, we're, we're just oozing nonverbal signals. Um, if you were ever nailed for being in love with somebody in high school, it probably happened, among other things, because you were walking too close to each other for normal conversation. You should have been further apart, or one of you may have bumped into the other. It never occurred to either of you to apologize, because the goal in that case is to establish physical contact, not to eliminate it or prevent it. Um, so there, there are just all sorts of, of different kinds of things that we can use. Attention getters, for instance, eyebrows raised. When I make a statement in class, Anybody, any college instructor is looking at things like bouncing feet. Bouncing feet are a sign of boredom or lack of understanding. So I'm, I'm always worried when I see bouncing feet in an auditorium. If you get into a lecture where, they, where it's, it's just totally boring to you, the effect is essentially you start doing other things. You invent other things to do. That's a sign to anybody who's paying attention. Raise eyebrows for skepticism or... You know, I make a statement, you know, the test is going to be this afternoon, pop quiz. <laughs> That'll get drawn down, drawn eyebrows, okay? Or nods of agreement or disagreement. This is very reinforcing for an instructor, unless you sit there a whole semester with your head about to fall off on, you know, on your lap. So you have to be careful in terms of how you employ them. But there are a lot of different maxims and rules that we utilize in communicating with each other. Finally, then, one of my favorite areas, which is basically slips of the tongue which is nothing more than an inadvertent, inadvertent linguistic error that you make. And these come in a variety of different fashions. They can occur at the level of, of um, phoneme, individual sound units. They occur sometimes at the level of morpheme, that is the unit gets mixed up, the unit of meaning gets mixed up. Or, in fact, in some cases, you get a larger unit of analysis where, they, where the switch or transposition or different kind of error is made. One of the oldest studies of this, surprisingly enough, was Freud. 
in his reference to what he called slips of the tongue, which is probably where that label originally came from. And in that case, his idea was that what's really happening there is that that is your unconscious speaking. In terms of Freud's view of, of pre uh, unconscious, preconscious, and, and conscious processing of, of uh, cognitions, what he was arguing was that when you do a slip of the tongue, it is actually the, sub the unconscious leaping forward and, and gaining control of your conversation so that what oozes out of us is, is perhaps unintended, perhaps disastrously unintended if you use the wrong word in talking about your boss or something like that. But what Freud was arguing was that that was essentially a kind of a burst through of the unconscious. But it is clear that what he was indicating was that the errors that occur are meaningful. That may or may not be true, but the way in which they occur is highly predictable. Uh, such errors are, are an excellent source of information about how we produce language. Let me show you what I mean. Slips may result when other sources of information to which we are attending, the radio, another conversation, something we're doing with our hands, becomes more relevant than whatever we're listening to. And I end up making a statement to my son of it. He's talking about where should we go for dinner, and I say, you know what, we can go to the radio, because I'm thinking about what's on the radio or something like that. And that's the case where the outside environment has, has jumped in and, and interfered with us. Um, so your, your head may not be exactly on target in that situation, and so the, what you're processing ends up jumping in and altering what you're trying to say to the person with whom you're interacting. It may indicate that our, our, simply our thoughts sometimes differ from precisely what we're saying, so that we're saying what's right in terms of what we're thinking, but maybe not right in terms of the flow of the actual conversation that we're working with. Victoria Fromkin, back in 1973, um, has identified some rather interesting uh, types of slips of the tongue, one of which is the anticipation error. This is where we use a language element before its appropriate place in the sentence. And in that case, you get something like an inspiring example becomes instead an expiring example. The X has been moved forward, so it's expiring rather than inspiring. That's an example of an anticipation error, which essentially is a slip of the tongue. On the other hand, by contrast to that, uh, we can get what is called a perseverative error. Perseveration is where essentially we use a language element after its appropriate place in the sentence. So the only real difference in the definition of those two is before or after. Other than that, the description of both of them is, is exactly the same. Um, at a parade, a bodacious float becomes a bodacious boat, where the bow has been carried forward inappropriately to the second word in that situation. I remember uh, a number several years ago, KUHF was in one of its uh, uh, fund solicitation contribution weeks, um, and then an, uh, obviously they are soliciting money there, voluntary contributions for the, the major source of funds that keeps it operating. And one of the announcers uh, was talking about calling in and distributing, uh, contributing early in the day to perform a good deed, which he pronounced as and did not detect as a good dude. You can call in early and perform a good dude and went right on. Clearly what was in his mind was the image of, of a, a solid contributor to the station, and what he ended up vocalizing was not good deed, but good dude, labeling who would actually do that. Um, substitution is another example. This is, uh, involves replacing one language element with another, um, as in look before you sleep. Okay? Or we can reverse or transpose sounds, which lends to some very clever ones, uh, where you switch the position of two language elements. Uh, the insect called a butterfly was originally called a flutterby, which makes perfect sense. A flutterby, as the um, as the example, but but uh, it became a preferred reversal, um, and thus it became butterfly instead of flutterby. Spoonerism is what we're talking about there, that involves switching uh, the sounds of two words um, to create two entirely new words and a properly inappropriate meaning. You have hissed all my mystery lectures. You have missed all my history lectures. My favorite was the person who introduced President Herbert Hoover a number of years ago, got right to the end of a very eloquent introduction and said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Hubert Heaver. <laughs> Insertions. In my own house, um, my first son, my original son, mispronounced Galleria for years, and it became known in the family as Gallerina. <laughs> no particular reason, but the, it was just an easy addition to the thing, which made it easier for him to pronounce. We can delete or blend things in certain situations. Uh, convenience may become convenience. That's a very typical spelling error. Um, motor hotel was ultimately shortened by you and I to motel. 
which is basically what it is, but they were originally called motor hotels. Um, notice all the different levels at which these, these uh, conversations, uh, errors can occur. It can occur at, at the phonemic level, bodacious boat, morphemic level, look before you sleep, and even um, semantic levels, you have hissed all my mystery lectures. There it's a much more complex kind of uh, confusion or error that takes place in that. Notice the parallels in the levels at which the, the errors are made. Initial con consonants are swapped in Hubert Heaver, okay? Final consonants are swapped with final consonants. These errors produce insight as to how speech is actually produced. That is, in, in phonemic errors, as a source of errors, a stressed word is more likely to influence another stressed word than it is a non-stressed word. And even with sound reversals and switches, notice that the rhythm and even the stresses in the sentence are maintained. You have hissed all my mystery lectures. Fits perfectly given or in the absence of the, the reverse there. At the level of words, common, and, uh, common word classes tend to be involved when problems are, are developed. Pro nouns are switched with nouns, verbs are switched with verbs, and so forth. In word substitution, syntactic categories tend to be preserved. And so in producing these various spoonerisms, we find that the errors can occur in either of two ways. They're spoken in terms of spoonerisms. The number of words spanned by those is never more than two or three, whether you're reading or writing. Suggesting that you and I are organizing our language, what I'm saying to you now is being pulled out of my memory only about three words ahead of what's actually coming out of my mouth. And thus we get these, the, when these errors do occur in the exchanges of noun and noun or sound and sound, it's only leading by about three words. That's kind of the maximum gap that you find. The test will follow this lecture.